Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Rich. That was a very nice introduction. Um, so uh, it is really great to be back at ApacheCon and also to see how many people are here for the first year. Um, that's awesome. So uh, my first ApacheCon was 15 years ago, not quite 20 years ago, the first one. And, uh, and that was in Las Vegas. And I'd been to, uh, to every ApacheCon in the US and Europe for several years until uh, something changed in uh, my plans. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, all right, so uh, I, um, I was on the incubator PMC. I uh, uh, was on the board of directors. And then um, I think uh, Sander here was the one who had this idea that maybe there should be a vice president of legal affairs. And me, not being a lawyer, ended up in that position. So, um, uh, so that was actually the, one of the main ways that I was involved in Apache back uh, about 15 years ago, 12, 13, 15 years ago. So then, um, one day, I was giving uh, a talk in Atlanta. And, um, and I decided to just walk around the city. And I walked right up to this. And um, so this is the grave of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, I just kind of stumbled upon it. And this was March 1st of 2006. And I, uh, I suddenly felt really small, really tiny. And I felt like he wouldn't be as proud of me and uh, what I was doing with my life as, as he could be. And, uh, and so I was just kind of thinking about the things I was doing in life and felt like um, there's something, something bigger. So it was really kind of this experience that, uh, that woke me up a bit. It didn't change me as a person. I was still, you know, same person, but just got very focused. And um, uh, so this, this grave is in this nice reflecting pool here. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a park around it with a statue of Gandhi and quotes from Gandhi and from Dr. King. And, uh, and one of the quotes, there's a lot of great stuff there, but one of the quotes that got me was uh, this one. So life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And so I thought about that a bit, and I felt like I was doing some things for others. I think, uh, I think uh, everyone here at Apache is doing things that's benefiting a lot of others. But for me, it, it, it made me feel like there was something more I needed to explore. So uh, I spent uh, the next six, uh, six months or so just kind of thinking, what's important to me? Um, what, of all the issues in the world, what, what really mattered to me? What, what felt like the greatest injustice in the world? And, uh, and so um, I thought about Monopoly. <laughs> and um, now here's the thing about Monopoly, is that Monopoly, a lot of people know about this game, uh, you start with a certain amount of cash. Everybody starts with the same amount of cash. Now, can you imagine if we, uh, tonight, we ended up playing Monopoly and, and you sat down to play um, or actually, yeah, you sat down to play with a few of us, and, um, and we gave you $5, but everyone else got $500. Um, and we said, okay, let's go. Let's see who wins. Let, everybody's got a good shot, right? We wouldn't play that game. We'd say, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, why would we do that? But that's what we do on this earth. That's what we do when people are born into a part of the world with far, far, far fewer resources than, than many of the rest of us. And, um, and so, you know, coming from Apache and thinking about meritocracy, um, that idea of, of um, equity, of getting equal access to resources, um, it's so, so, so far out of balance that for me it was the thing that I felt like I've got to be part of changing something with this situation. So, uh, so I wrote an email to Apache, which I found last night. And, uh, and said, hey, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm turning over my vice president of legal affairs work to Sam Ruby. And um, I'll be traveling without internet. And so a few people said, what? What's going on? No internet? That's, that's pretty strange. Um, so then I had to do a follow-up email that said, OK, you know, a couple of people have asked. I'm off to a remote region of Ghana to study health, education, and microcredit to address rural poverty. I don't want to bore anyone, but that's basically the thing. So now I'm, I'm going to to explain this a little bit more. 
So, uh, so yeah, so this was uh, July of 2007. So here's what I did. I, um, I went out to Ghana, um, and uh, Rich gave me this nice introduction to say I went to Ghana to change the world, but it was, it was definitely much more about I went to Ghana, and, and Ghana changed me. I was able to understand the world a little bit more. Um, so I, I went there out to this remote rural part of Ghana. So Ghana is in West Africa. Um, and, uh, and you could go to dozens and dozens of countries, and if you go to the right place in those countries, out to the more remote rural areas, um, you'll see some similar, uh, a lot of similarities. Uh, so here's an example of people um, sitting under the big tree uh, that's, that's typically going to be around a rural village along the side of the road, and they're there, and they're very interested in something, and what, what it is is that uh, a group of people with information about health came to talk to them. And so now these people are all farmers, and they, it was during the growing season, but it was so important they actually left their farm to learn about how they could take care of their children's health. So for instance, um, uh, malaria uh, in, in Ghana is a huge killer of, of children and pregnant women. Um, in fact, in a lot of these countries, uh, if you have a child, there's about a, between a, a 10 and 20 percent chance that one of your children is going to die by the time they reach age five. And so this is the, the reality people are living with. And, and so if someone has some information about how you can, you can prevent your child from dying, they're, they're pretty interested. So now the problem is, People will say, well, um, one of the great ways of uh, avoiding malaria is to use bed nets. But there's a few important things about that. Uh, if you drop bed nets into a village, people have to know how to use them and why to use them. Is it really important? So for instance, this example here, this, this gentleman needs to understand that the net needs to be tucked around you under the mattress. Um, uh, you can't have your arm poking out. You can't, uh, you can't have holes, in the, uh, like big holes in the bed net or the mosquitoes will go right through. It should be treated with insecticide. Um, it shouldn't be leaning on your skin. Um, so there's all these uh, pieces of information about how to use a bed net and the fact that the most important use of a bed net is, is not for your crops. Um, it's not as a fishing net. It's not as many other things. But but why not? Why is it really important? And so if people can hear um, opinion leaders in their own communities um, talk about the importance of this, this kind of thing, then that can convince them to say, maybe, maybe this is important. Maybe this actually can make the difference between whether my child lives or dies. So, um, so that's, that was some of what I learned uh, when I went out there uh, back in um, 2007. So uh, what I'll do is just going to give you a quick overview. I'm going to show you uh, um, about a two-minute video. Uh, there was a news crew that came in. We won this award uh, a few years back, and the, and the prize was basically a, um, a really, really heavy um, thing I had to carry back from uh, Doha. Uh, but more importantly, a, a, a video. And so I'm just going to show you a quick little video that some documentary crew did about what's going on. A rural area in the Upper West region of Ghana, where most of the people are farmers, undereducated and without access to electricity or mobile networks. The Talking Book is an affordable audio computer. It's a major source of information. Um, the Talking Book is um, one of the most um, robust devices that um, technological interventions that has uh, been created on the world in the past few years. It's a multimedia application that helps make relevant knowledge in agriculture and health available to uh, people that live um, in rural places, people that are the last, the hard to reach people in, in, in rural places. Behind the audiobook program is the NGO Literacy Bridge, which partners organizations like UNICEF, CARE and MEDA to generate messages on agriculture and health. Information is created in the form of drama, song or an interview and transferred into the talking book. The gadget is powered by batteries and they are circulated between the communities and Literacy Bridge's offices where they are charged. Users navigate simple audio menus in any language and then listen. So, now, 
Through the talking book, we've learned where to access fertilizer and how to apply it to our crops. Also, our farm animals used to die prematurely, but with the help of this device, we know now how to care for them. The talking bug is the only source of information on modern methods of agriculture and health care in these remote communities. The talking books teach us so many things, but in all, I'm much particular about the cholera that's come in Ghana this year. But due to these talking books, we have learned a lot and we have made sure that the measures that we have put in place, we are safe from this cholera. Talking Buck allows its users to record feedback by a single click on a button. Even with the user feedback, with the user feedback we statistics we have, the Talking, have, the talking Book is designed in such a way that people can record a message through that user feedback, letting us know what they are actually benefiting from in the Talking Book. And we can make the Talking Book available to every family and to extend the program to the whole Upper West, the whole Jirapa, or even the whole of Ghana. Or even the whole Ghana. Okay, so um, now uh, you might have noticed that they, they referred to the organization as Literacy Bridge. So that was the name that we started with. We just changed it to Amplio in last year. Part of the reason is because um, when Rich mentioned you know, things that I've learned along the way and that has changed what we were doing, well, it was my idea to invent some sort of uh, piece of technology that could be useful for children in classrooms. So, so we had, and most of the classrooms are actually much more crowded than this. Uh, you're kind of seeing a little sub-classroom here. It's usually about 80 to 100 kids in a class with one teacher. And so I had this idea of, um, of really low-cost audio technology that would allow children to hear messages, or hear um, books being read by their own teacher and it would allow the teacher to kind of be in lots of places at once in a way. Um, so that was the idea, but when I went out into these communities and I met with, with everyone I could to understand issues of poverty, it was the people who were in health and who were in agriculture who said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not a technology person, but let me understand, you're saying you, you wanna create this audio device that could be very easy for people to use, even in uh, villages without electricity, um, and they don't need to be able to read, and they could use it and play audio. And you want to do this in schools. Well, that sounds nice, but let me tell you what I would do if, if I had something like that. I would record everything I know that I try to teach people about farming. You know, or, or the health people would say, everything I know that are important for parents to know about taking care of their kids' health. And I'd put that on that device, and I would leave it in the village, because the problem is I can only get there maybe every couple years, two or three years. And when I get there, I've got all this knowledge to share, but the people there uh, are in most of these villages are illiterate, and so they can't take notes. So can you imagine uh, you're a farmer and someone says, okay, so you farm four different crops. Um, well, let me give you all this information about preparing your land and planting the seeds and how far apart should your seeds be? What month should you make sure you plant by? How do you harvest and, and weed and, fertil and how do you make fertilizer and store it and negotiate with a middleman in the value chain? All this kind of stuff. And someone's saying, what, what? Okay, uh, I, I think I got that part. Uh, you're coming back in three years? <laughs> that, that would drive me crazy. Uh, um, so what they said was, if I could take all that knowledge and put it on a device like this, that's what I would do. So I said, well, we should probably try that too. So we did both things, and uh, we saw a lot of, um, of great possibility in the schools. And, um, but, the, but what we also saw was some pretty exciting things going on in the villages. So here's what happened. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase that uh, IQ is evenly distributed around the human race and around the world. Um, well, let me give you an example of this. Uh, here's what this guy did. So this guy, his name's Felix. When we gave him a talking book um, that was loaded with content on agriculture, he did an A-B test. Um, this guy had never been to school before. Uh, this was his idea. I wish I could claim credit for it, but he said, um, 
He said, you know what, let's see if this works. I'm going to take my corn crop and on half of it, I'm just going to plant the same way I've always planted with the way my parents and grandparents taught me. And on the other half, I'll try all these different things. I'll try uh, putting my, my chickens and my goats, uh, I'll build a pen for them to stay in at night because otherwise these farm animals are just all over the, you know, the roads and everywhere. Um, but I'll keep them in a same pen at night and that will essentially allow them to, to poop and I'll be able to pick it up and uh, it'll be all in one place. I'll be able to use this to create manure. I'll apply it just the right way. I'll build beds of dirt instead of little mounds of dirt. I'll space it the right way. I'll make sure I plant it in the right month. I'll do all these things and let's see if it makes a difference. And that's the difference it made. So I took those photos and I was blown away and really uh, indebted to Felix that he, he was uh, smart enough to try this out. This is the kind of thing is that if, if you can get resources to, to people, people who are otherwise just don't have that opportunity, what great things can they do? Um, so th when we saw these kind of results, um, we said, well, we're a small organization. We've got to focus. We can't be doing some things in schools and some things with connecting people in villages with knowledge. Um, and so we had to shut down the school program. So that was a, a tough call, but, but I feel like if you're going to do something uh, if you're, especially if you're doing something like a, a, a nonprofit, why not be the best in the world at what you're doing? And if you're not the best in the world, if you can't be the best in the world, why not support whoever is the best in the world? And so I felt like there's no way we could be the best in the world at two things, two very different types of things. So we dropped the school program and focused on, on this idea. So basically what hopefully you got from the video is it's about taking knowledge from local experts in the local language, recording that in an audio form. They're often speaking about uh, agriculture or um, health behaviors. And then our focus is on the most vulnerable communities, um, people where um, they just are, uh, they've got challenges that we can't even imagine and fewer resources than we could imagine trying to deal with it. And there are a lot of great organizations out there helping a lot of people who are in need, but our focus is really the ones that are the hardest to reach, are the ones that are often getting overlooked because it's, it's not easy um, to, to to find ways around these challenges of no electricity and illiteracy and remote areas and extreme poverty. So people take these devices and they listen to them and they talk about these messages together. Um, when they're farming, they're, they're taking it out on their farms and listening to it together. And that's basically the idea. So now I just uh, will tell you a little bit about um, the technology. I figured that you might be interested in what are the, the main pieces, how does it work? So, um, <clears throat> So here's, here's the device. Now I'm going to have a few of these on the, uh, the Apache table. Um, uh, so if you're interested in looking at it later, or if you see me around at the uh, reception tonight, I'll, I'll probably have one of these on me, and I'm happy to show you. But basically, this is the idea. So you see in the top right, it, it, um, it uh, just runs off batteries, um, because in a lot of villages, you don't have electricity. Uh, we have a model now that has rechargeable batteries. So if someone has the ability to like charge a cell phone over a solar power charger or something like that, you can equally charge this just over the same USB connection. Um, the issue is that a lot of the people who are most vulnerable in the world don't own their own phone. Um, it's changing, but the access, and I mean, it's been changing for 11 years that I've been doing this, but, uh, but there are no smartphones at all where, where we work. And the, then there often are some of these small like flip phones, but the people who have typically been disenfranchised the most, especially women, um, are not the ones that own these phones. So this is one of the reasons why we could, I could tell you more about uh, um, some of the issues with phones. But so it just runs with batteries. You can either use the small uh, AA batteries or large D either will fit, but not both. Um, and. Uh, and it basically uh, just speaks to you in, in your language, so. Okay, so maybe it'll be helpful if I give you an English version. Um, so that's, that's one version that's used, but here's a demonstration. Welcome to the talking book. Press the right hand to choose a subject. Health. To learn about health, press the tree. To try another subject, press the right hand. Farming. To learn about farming, livestock, to learn about livestock. So you get the idea, lots of different categories of information. And then uh, if you go to health, for to instance, 
Queen Mother's speech on exclusive breastfeeding. My name is Queen Lady Rebecca Taksuta Dombo. I am the Queen Mother of Sherapa. I have four children of which I have raised with exclusive breastfeeding for six months after birth. I have, I have sister-in-laws and daughters who equally have children. My advice to them has always been to practice exclusive breastfeeding for six months. So this is just one example. Um, the issue is that, um, uh, I don't know, how many of you are parents? Okay, good. All right, me too. So when I became a new parent, I didn't know that I shouldn't feed uh, my daughter food on when she was born. I mean, I eat food. Why shouldn't she eat food when she was a month old? Um, and, uh, or water even. Um, so especially if you're out in a remote village where the water and the food are, 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 going, are going to be contaminated and small little babies can die from things like that. Um, that's why they emphasize uh, breastfeeding. There's not a lot of formula out there in these remote villages. But the thing is that um, that doesn't make any sense to someone who's like, what do you mean not feed water to my baby? You want me to, to starve my baby? That's crazy. And so you need to have these opinion leaders who can, uh, who can speak uh, authoritatively to people who they can connect with. Um, and also you want to use the, the, the kind of um, uh, ways that people talk to each other in dramas or in uh, songs. So here's a song. So this was a locally recorded song using a wooden xylophone because that's what people uh, uh, used in that particular area. And, um, and it's talking about why it's so important to use bed nets. So that's, that's kind of the approaches. It's not just the technology, but it's getting the right content on that that works for people. Now, one of the key things is you'll see it's got a, a microphone for user feedback. Um, that was one of those things that I, I think I wasn't expecting how important it would be. Um, but it's one thing to get messages to remote villages so that they can learn all these uh, new ideas, um, but it's, just as important, if not more important, to listen to them and hear not just what they know, what works for them, what they've tried, but also what they need or what they don't need. And so we partner with organizations like UNICEF and, uh, and government health ministries, the World Health Organization. Um, and a lot of times they are pretty sure they know what people need, but they're often wrong. And, uh, and so we go out there and we try to check to make sure that we've got the right messages. But when we hear people giving feedback, you know, often it's, it's really nice feedback. It's saying, hey, I've tried this and, uh, and suddenly I'm growing more food and all this is great. But sometimes they say, you know, you told me uh, we shouldn't marry our daughters off when they're 14 years old. Okay, that's, that sounds good. We actually, in our villages, we learned that a few years ago, even though it was a traditional practice. We no longer want our daughters to be married off when they're 14 or 15. But yet, it still happens. Do you want to know why? Well, lately these days, we've got this problem of teen pregnancy. And so, yeah, when they get pregnant, then sometimes they want to get married or sometimes we think that's the best thing. If you really want to get to the root of the problem, let's talk about teen pregnancy. Now, that's something we weren't even thinking about. And so, this idea of listening to people to, to direct even big organizations, great organizations like UNICEF to, to focus in the right areas is important. So I'll just show you, uh, uh, Rich brought up this device, which I didn't know he had from long ago. This one looks a little bit different from this one. So let me tell you about that. So this, is what, this was the first version. Um, and you notice it's got these arrows on it. Here is a problem that I learned was um, for a while, you know, people would, what this, what this is saying is saying, you know, press the right hand to listen to different topics. Well, when the message was going really long in some of these languages, I was like, why is it taking so long to say the right arrow? And what I learned was there's no word for arrow in a lot of these languages. There's a bow and arrow, but not like a directional arrow like you'd have on a map or something. And so what people, in trying to be helpful, they were saying, there are four points that look kind of similar on this device, press the one on the right. <laughs> that, that's a really long way to get to, you know, press the right something. So, uh, so we did an icon study. We had all kinds of icons that represented different things that we saw. I'd take photos of different things in villages. I'd send it off to a designer who would do a little 
uh, icon representation. And then we would do uh, studies and see how fast people could identify them. If I said, uh, where's the tree? They'd point to something, and or it wouldn't be me. It would be the translator saying that. And then we'd see what, how fast they'd point to it. And then from that, we ended up coming up with what were the most successful icons, but then how does it look on the device? Collecting these different icons, what do people like best? And so we would do um, uh, uh, little user focus groups and say, which one, which one is most pleasant to you? And so that was uh, one of the things we learned. And it's very different um, being in the US and you know, thinking you know what might be right. And it worked pretty well. Um, but it's another thing to go in and to do some really detailed studies. So we went from this to, to this. Um, so uh, last thing I'll say about technology is, um, is monitoring the data is, a, is another thing we've done a lot of lately. So um, we know exactly whenever someone pushes a button. Now, we don't get to see it immediately because there's no network in these places. But it's logged on the device. And when someone connects uh, a, uh, an Android phone, so most people don't have uh, smartphones. Um, in fact, none, no one has a smartphone in these villages. But when someone who is visiting one of these communities regularly they bring uh, an Android phone with an app that uh, was uh, developed by an, a volunteer from Apache, actually. Um, what they can do is they can plug that into this device. It updates it with new, fresh content. And it grabs all the usage statistics and those user feedback messages that were on there and uploads it to our, um, our servers. And then we have these graphs of lots of different dashboard stuff to show what are people listening to? What are they talking about? What's the, what are the, um, the most popular messages? What villages are least engaged? And that, that, of course, is super important if you're serious about making sure people are involved in your project. So uh, last couple things I'll just say is, uh, is how to grow something like this. Um, and how to do it the right way. So we wanted to be narrowly focused on, on knowledge. We wanted to be the best in the world at how can you provide knowledge that we all take for granted to people in remote communities. Um, the issue, though, is if you want to make an impact, yeah, there's this knowledge chain of you know, knowledge and awareness, behavior change. But there's this other stuff on the right that we were not doing. How do people have the resources? Where are the bed nets? Who's giving them that? How about any seeds or fertilizer that would be useful for the farms? How about even uh, a buyer to buy their crops? How, these are all questions that these families were asking us. And we were saying, oh, yeah, that would be useful. We should probably figure that out. But should we do that? So we realized we need to partner with other organizations to do that. So we started partnering with um, organizations like UNICEF and agriculture organizations. and we. And we say, you guys do the part that you do well. We're going to provide the knowledge that supports that and bring these resources and knowledge together. So we partnered with uh, organizations like uh, CARE and UNICEF and AGRA. And here's about how we've been scaling so far. So um, 10 years ago, when uh, I gave a keynote at ApacheCon, the last time I was at ApacheCon, um, we were just starting. We kind of experimented with a few hundred people. So now we reach about 600,000. Um, but we, uh, we want to go a bit bigger than that. And so these are the different partners um, that have joined on with us. And now we're in Ghana and Kenya and Rwanda and uh, Uganda. And, uh, but we're looking at more bigger numbers. I, I'm not sure that our organization will reach a billion people in the next few years or by 2030. But the United Nations has these sustainable development goals you might have heard of. And it applies to all countries. But uh, our focus is on these issues of poverty and health um, and, uh, and the environment and all of these things that apply to, um, it applies to all of us. But how will people who have no formal education and no access to knowledge, how are they going to achieve these? So we're partnering with some big organizations to, to not just help us do the work we're doing, but to help others learn from what we're doing to, to reach the poorest billion people on the planet. And so how has this changed anything? Well, we've done randomized control trials, and we've seen uh, that 50% more mothers are sleeping under bed nets now than in the control groups. Um, farmers are winning awards. In fact, the woman on the, the right was the best soybean farmer in the entire country of Ghana. There are 28 million people in Ghana. So we were not expecting to get those kind of results. Um, but the other farmers were growing 48% more crops. Um, whereas the ones who were not using the device in the same year had a 5% drop. 
So those are the kind of things that we have to see. Is it actually making a difference? And keep looking at that. Um, we've actually won a couple of awards, too. I've ended up meeting some interesting people in the process. Um, and the, the, the funny thing is that like, you know, when I was working in, in software, purely software, I was not no one, None of these folks were looking forward to meeting me. But once I started doing <laughs> the thing that I was passionate about, uh, then uh, it's interesting who, who, who gets involved. So uh, the very last thing I'll, uh, I'll show you is just how it's um, affected some of these uh, women around health. And so I'll let them speak for themselves. <laughs> The one planet named Kirat in Dundana Postal, a marum baby. A cote, a nat a poor pools, a poor pool minam Kiba Minta and Maro. Not on Tuna Alia Bira Jack Paratuma, who might yea, who man let a lamp here, at no hot to Magre, who all a year in that pool. In your rejectly, quote to Macantona. Yea, dear. Yell a minam Kel Wunla at a baby, the Birkwater Royala. The demand dollar to be during the lang at the bonnet break at the Biena Cotipilla. Just so Pampanet Nanke Latin Tundana a Birkwater Royalana. So the man dollar to be a law, a docomora, Birkwa Yaluna. Manya la be caught a fan. Unan get a schoolman, or young man Yurula. Cho and Tolomen of Alabia win view. In your Clanancia, a idea. I want to say, poor and uncle, who been securing that. In Tias and Banaka, counting what do Bangera. I let a tassum, I let Nanda, I be Vidman one year about me. Tanya, when a man like a carab, a suit, a pair of car, there walk here, a banwa. In Tia, but a man like a tie young, can and tab and a boy be ribby wee. Let Nanda Zura as eat and Mother Zura as eat the singer. Nanka la puli puli yella there. Okay, so uh, I could not have done this without uh, a lot of Apache people, um, a bunch of people in this room, and I mean, literally dozens of folks from Apache were supporting me very, very early on. Um, some of it was in code. Uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we have uh, an app that was developed by someone who heard me speak at the keynote 10 years ago, um, and also this, uh, this uh, audio content manager, you, you've got a lot of audio, but how do you tag it with all the right information and maintain it and do it in an offline environment that sometimes is connected and sometimes not. Um, so I've had a lot of support from Apache folks uh, through, um, through volunteering, um, but also even in donations. So there's uh, uh, an Apache member, Bill Rowe, who's uh, been one of the many people who's been uh, supporting, donating to this work, and he actually uh, told me when he heard I was coming out here that he's putting up a $10,000 challenge grant. So if any of you are interested in philanthropy and any of you find this work important to you, um, then if you do decide to donate to this organization and help make this possible, um, uh, Bill Rowe is going to match that dollar for dollar up to the first $10,000. So we actually have a Facebook campaign going on, or if you donate at our website, um, that'll be matched, and that's uh, through this week of ApacheCon. So if you're curious in Facebook, you can just type in Amplio and you'll see us there and you'll see fundraisers. And then there's the Apache one. And we've already got some folks started. So, uh, so anyway, thank you very much for your time. It's really an honor to be back at ApacheCon again and, um, and uh, look forward to talking to you at the reception tonight.